Okay, you guys should all see that now. All right, yep. so it said that it wasn't working right. And so what does that mean? Well, this is, so it's typical that you will not get very specific details when you get called to work on something. Something will be broken and the person that made the call is not technically inclined more than likely. So they're gonna say things like, yeah, it's just all cattywampus. It's like, I don't know what's wrong with it, but it doesn't work. And you say, well, what do you mean it doesn't work? You know, you're trying to get specific so you can zero in. You're not gonna get that a lot of times. So sometimes you're just going in blind and you gotta to try to feel your way out on your own. And this is kind of an example that where I say, what could be wrong with this? And you guys have to kind of step back and say, I don't know what, but the thing is it's not working as it's supposed to. So if you set something like maybe this thermostat switch, because the problem is that the pilot circuit's not working. This isn't part of that. So if you said this thermostat was broken or, or it was open, that's not it. The fact that this is open, or closed doesn't matter because it's not part of the pilot, doesn't affect the pilot light operation in any way. It affects the main gas burner. But part, this thing being open, that's normal. If the temperature's got it open, that's what it's supposed to do. So let's take a look a little bit at this. So my main gas line is coming in here. This represents piping. And there's a Y here. So some of the gas is going here to the main burner, but there's a valve that blocks it. So we can say that this purple is gas. So this, this valve blocks gas from going out into this area here. What controls this valve is this solenoid. When this becomes, when current goes through this, this becomes magnetic, an electromagnet. And when it does, it pulls a piece of steel up towards it and opens this valve and then the valve will rush out. Hopefully there's a pilot light here that'll ignite it or you've got problems. So there's safety things in place here so that this doesn't open up and gas just spews out into your room to be ignited later. So the gas is diverted off here and it goes to this pilot light. And this is operated by another solenoid that when current flows through this, it becomes an electromagnet and it'll pull this in and let the gas come into the main, the gas can't get in anywhere until, the pilot, until this is open. Once this opens, then it'll go here, but it's blocked till later and then come around here. And so you light this either with so the valve, yeah, the valve operates through this, but first you can manu manually push this valve open. And that's the little button that you have to push that says pilot light. So you push this thing open to get the gas to flow, and then you light it with a match or an igniter. And if you were to let go of it right then, well, the, the, this valve would go back closed again and the flame would go out. So you guys have probably experience this. So what you have to do is push that in, light it, and wait for this to heat up because this is the thermocouple. As we talked a little bit about last week, because these are dissimilar metals on each side, there's more electrons go one way than on the other. That creates a voltage and that will cause the current to flow. This heats up enough to get this current flow enough to make this magnetic field strong enough, it'll pull that in and then you can let go of it. So you have to understand when you're looking at what's wrong, you have to understand how it's supposed to work so you can troubleshoot it when it doesn't work. And I would say that's one of the main things about troubleshooting is trying to get to understand how it's supposed to work when it's working normally so that you can zero in on what might not be working. So again, the fact that the thermostat's not open, you wouldn't even wanna look there because that doesn't have any effect on what we're trying to do. What's happening now is I can push this in and light it and it doesn't matter how long I hold that, as soon as I let go of it, it goes out again. That's telling me it's broken. It's not operating normally. So what could be wrong? 
And some of you have some pretty good ones. Because one thing is, is this flame isn't getting this hot enough. Why? Because maybe there's an obstruction here that maybe it lights, but it's not lighting enough of a flame to get up in here and heat this up substantially. That could be one. And some of you mentioned that. Some of it, and this has happened to me on my fire logs, is this gets bent. This is just kind of hanging out there on a probe like thing. And if it gets bent um, away from the flame, then it won't get hot enough. So those are just physical things that can happen that cause this not to work. Um, of course, if there's a break in this loop anywhere, that would cause this not to create a magnetic field and then it would never pull in. Now, somebody said the valve was stuck. Well, no, because if the valve was stuck, you wouldn't be able to push it in manually and, and get this thing to light. The problem is when you let go of it, it's not staying in. So, either, so basically, the problem's right in here. The problem has to be right in here in this electric, this electric circuit here with the addition that the flame has to affect that. Questions? So the possible problems are either of the metal pieces could be damaged that represent the thermal couple. The pilot light couldn't burn, be burning hot enough or close there would enough. be close enough or there would be a break inside of the uh, conductor for the uh, circuit. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say that's the only thing because I've learned over the years, to like never say never and stuff like that, because there's some things that could happen that aren't likely to happen. And that's something that can throw a technician off too, is that you start looking at every possibility instead of just the likely ones. Because if I check all this out, it's like, that's all good. What's left? Well, there's other things. I mean, there's actually a mechanical piece that links this valve to this. So I might be able to push it in and out because it's connected to my finger, but it doesn't mean that even that I'm getting enough here and maybe the solenoid, the magnet works and the solenoid does pull in, is somehow disconnected from the valve. So the valve doesn't open, even though this is operating. That's not, that's not likely to happen as much as these other things we've been talking about, but it could. Talking about current, it's a flow rate, a rate of flow of electrons. And you can see here that if I'm looking at, there's, I've, I've got a source here that's moving electrons around this circuit. How fast are they coming? Well, we can measure. If we sit here and count them as they cross this line, that'll tell us how fast they're coming. If we count them and time them, we know their rate of flow. So in the, in the field of electricity, if I can get six and a quarter billion billion electrons to go past this point in one second, that rate of flow is what we call one amp. So one amp is not a quantity of electrons. It's a, it's a quantity of electrons per second. It's a big quantity, six and a quarter billion billion, which they call a coulomb. A coulomb is just like you call 12 eggs a dozen. You call six and a billion billion electrons a coulomb. So if I can get this to move around here at one coulomb per second, that's one amp. Voltage is the difference in electric charge between two points. We said the difference in electric charge is because there's more electrons that are negative in charge in one place than there are in another place. And so I've got electrons down here more than I have up here, and that's why this part is negative. And I don't know exactly, although I could find out, or so could you, how many electrons it actually takes, how many more electrons I have to have down here 
to make this difference one volt of force. Um, but whatever that is, whenever you get that much difference, that tension builds up that it'll move six in a billion billion electrons through one resistance of ohm in one second. So there's one amp. It takes one volt. If you're faced with one ohm resistance to move one amp. And that's kind of what this is the schematic. If I have one volt forcing electrons and I have one ohm opposing the flow of electrons, the balance of those two forces results in one amp. Up here, I use the magnets again. After I listened to my video last week, I can't believe how many times I said magnets, but um, so magnets, here I've got a difference in polarity and there's a force here, but if I increase the difference, now you can just imagine that there's more force. So that's the same thing as happened here. I add electrons, this force gets stronger. I add magnets, the force gets stronger. And with that stronger force, there's a greater tendency to cause motion. In this case, metal, and in this case, electrons. Okay, so resistance is the opposition to the flow of current. And it's completely caused by friction. Electrons are trying to move through a conductor, a wire or a, or a trace on a circuit board, trying to move through it, but it's rubbing against other electrons in the rest of the atoms. It's friction. And that friction causes heat, just like when you're rubbing your hands together, it causes heat. And so down here, I've got voltage that's trying to move electrons through a conductor, and I've got the resistance that's trying to push it back or resist it. And we can see that if I was, were to back off on this resistance, then more electrons would flow, or they would flow faster, however you want to look at it. And we could also see that if you increase the force behind the push, then you're going to have increased flow. This is an example I used to use, uh, I used to just kind of do this up in front of the classroom, but let's say that this is a box. And in that box is six and a quarter billion billion electrons. And I'm trying to move them because I'm a battery. I'm trying to move those, uh, but there's friction that kind of fights against me. And I think you could see that the speed that I'm able to move this the flow rate is based on how much push I have from a six volt battery or a 12 volt battery and how much opposition I'm getting to my push due to friction. And that if I were to reduce the friction by saying spraying lemon pledge all over the floor, you could see that I would be able to increase my rate of movement. And you can also see if my buddy came and he was the same as me, and we doubled the exertion here, the force, again, that would cause an increase in the speed. So this relationship that we're talking about here of voltage pushing electrons and resistance opposing them, and that flow of electrons is current, these are your real basics of electrical circuits. And it's important that you have that understanding of that relationship. And it's really, it's really pretty common sense um, when you think about it. And other examples, if you're going down the highway in a car and you have your hand out the window and I do this, the flow's the same, the flow of air, but when I increase the resistance, how much more force is there now that wants to move? So, yeah, if you're watering the lawn, um, you've got a certain force behind that hose coming from pumps somewhere at the water station or from your place. Um, and there's a certain restriction in the nozzle, but the nozzle and a certain flow comes out as a result of that. And if somebody comes up and they stand on the hose and cause that, re that restriction or that resistance to go up, obviously the flow goes down. So these are common sense things that you've experienced 
yourself. So it's probably a good idea that when we're talking about this invisible stuff, electricity, yeah, it's invisible only because it's really, really tiny, but it acts the same way as things that you can see, things that you have experienced. So don't lose sight of that. Don't think that electricity is magical and mystical because it's unseen. It's not, it's not invisible only to the naked eye. Because I think it, if, if you're comfortable with it, it's like, oh yeah, that's just like when I'm watering the lawn or that's just like whatever example you come up with in your mind, that helps, that goes a long way in learning. Energy. Energy is the ability to do work. Energy is power times time. It's the ability to do work. And it comes in forms of wind, it comes thermal and combustion, it comes mechanical in forms of motion and others. There's light energy. Uh, and we measure it in kilowatt hours, kilowatts times hours. And this is a typical meter that you would be familiar with that measures energy. Energy is different from power. Power is how much energy is being used in a given length of time. So how much work are you doing? How fast, how quickly are you doing work? That's what power is, how quickly you're doing work. Energy is the ability to do work, and power is how quickly you're doing that work. Um, so when you think about power, you typically think of watts, electrical power, and uh, you know a lot of other kinds of power expressed in watts and kilowatts. What about, does anybody know any other way that we, that we express power? Horsepower? Horsepower. Yeah. So back in the old days, even before I was born, they would use horses to plow fields. And there was a particular horse, a dray horse, that was used to draw the plows. And I mean, this is not a very scientific measurement, but whatever a horse could plow in a day was considered to be one horsepower. And I don't know how much that is, but it was considered whatever a horse could do in one day was, a, was one horsepower. So if you had two horses, then obviously you could do twice as much or get that same amount done in half the time. But again, it's the amount of work that's being done in a particular time unit. Here, I've got a box and I'm moving this box. My work is moving a mass times a distance. So the work that I'm doing is moving this box. It's not going very fast, but if I were to, to make it go faster, to get this same amount of work done, moving it from the front to the back, get that done faster, I would have to have more power. Probably that motor is measured in horsepower. So some electric motors are measured in horsepower, but my motorcycle engine, combustion engine, it's measured in kilowatts. So it's not, there's not set rules. All right, so it's made of volts and amps. Power is equal to voltage times current or watts is equal to volts times amps. Anybody know where this is? This is, uh, this is in Babcock State Park, southern part of West Virginia. Um, so there's a some mill here. And I'm thinking, hey, that's, a, that's pretty cool. You know, they grind corn there, uh, cornmeal. To, and I like, I like cornbread. So I really like that stone ground cornbread. So I'm going to get me I'm going to get me one of these mills and I take it home and it's like, ah, uh, guess what? I didn't think this through because I don't have a stream. So now what am I going to do with this mill? I already bought the cornmeal. So I'm going to uh, go out in my garage and look around and it's like, oh, I can move it with this. If I find a squirt gun, belong to one of the kids. So I got there with that squirt gun, fill it up, start squirting that water wheel and nothing happens. There's not enough power. 
um, there's not enough power to move that wheel. So I go back out the garage, I'm looking around and it's like, here's that old pressure washer that I used to have. I'm gonna use it instead of a little trigger pump on my squirt gun, I'm gonna hook this pressure washer up to the squirt gun. And so I go out there and that thing puts out a pretty strong stream and that wheel starts to turn a little bit, but it's not turn, it's gonna take me a long time to grind corn with this thing. I don't have enough power. I've got some force, I've got the voltage, but I don't have much of a stream or current. So I go back out the garage, look it around, I find a piece of old fire hose. So I hook that up to my pressure pump, and now I've got the voltage, the force, and I've got the current, and now I have enough power to do the work that I wanted to do in a reasonable amount of time. So in that analogy, um, the speed of the water is the current? The, yes. And then the power of the water is the voltage? The force that's moving that, yes. The force the, behind yeah, the, it. yeah, the force behind the water. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, we talk about the speed and that's right because it's a flow rate, but it's also the quantity, right? It's a quantity, the speed of that quantity, yeah. So you've got a high volume that's moving rapidly. Uh, we talked about continuity and we'll talk just a little bit more about that. You can see up here in this example, I've got, so L1 and L2, this stands for line one and line two. So that would typically mean AC current, probably 120 volts. This is one side and there's nothing that's drawn connecting this, but we're assuming that there's an AC power support supply that's pushing power, pushing current through this way and then returning this way and I've got my loop. So you'll see drawings that'll be indicated like this, L1 and L2, know that this is like the prongs of a, of a plug-in on your lamp. This plugs into one slot and this plugs into the other. There's something behind it. L1 is trying to push electrons, but it can't because I've got an open circuit. This has broken the continuity. Consequently, none of them are going through the load, so no work is being done by the load. Over here, the switch is closed, so the electrons can move through that, and that would make that work. Same thing that's going on here. It's, more, it's much like a, a draw bridge. Um, whenever you open that up, the traffic has to stop. You don't get any flow uh, until that's closed again. Speaking of bridges, Yeah, one, one more time. Okay, because you guys paid good money for this course. Um, this shows a little bit, again, that relationship with, re with force over here. This force is being created from this head of water. Um, the flow that results the, the, and remember that the current is a result. The current is a result of the voltage and the resistance. And this is what you're seeing here. An increase of resistance starts to decrease the flow. All right, so all this stuff we've been talking about, this relationship between voltage, resistance, and current is Ohm's law. Ohm's law expresses that in an equation. Now, I can tell you that when you're doing work, technical work, you don't necessarily 
have to come up with very precise numbers. Most of the time, you just need to be in a ballpark. If I'm looking at a circuit and, I, and it says on the drawing that it's supposed to be nine volts, but when I put a meter on it, it says that it's 8.85, that's probably what's not what's causing the thing not to work right. You know, so usually you're going to see like the voltage is going to say nothing or two volts when it's supposed to be nine. Now you've got a problem. But um, again, a lot of times you just need to be in a ballpark with stuff. So don't ever approach a problem too much in detail. Don't get, do, get in that thing about you can't see the forest for the trees. Before you start digging into a lot of prints and really doing the heavy head work, Again, step back and make sure nobody kicked off a piece of conduit or a fork truck didn't knock something off, a limit switch or something off that's causing something not to work. Uh, but sometimes you do need to calculate numbers and that's what Ohm's law is good for. What's more important is what I've been trying to get across to you that current is the result of the interaction between voltage and resistance. If you have that understanding and it's almost intuitive to you that if you raise the voltage, the force, well then yeah, then you're gonna move things more. Or if I increase the opposition to that force, that's gonna slow things down. If you can make that intuitive, that's a lot more important in your ability to solve problems with circuits than mathematically doing this. But still, the math's not too tough. This is a division problem, right? Okay, so I've got a 12 volt source and I have a three ohm resistance. This thing's pushing as hard as it can. This 12 volt battery is pushing as hard as it can to move as many electrons as it can against three ohms. But it's only gonna get so far. It's locked in stone through physics that it's only gonna get four amps, no more, no less, it's gonna get exactly four amps. If you have exactly 12 volts and exactly three ohms, four amps is the exact result that'll happen. Dave, is there sort of a rule of thumb for like how close something should be before you'd be worried like 5% or 10%? Well, if there is, I don't know what it is. Um, so like if it's, let's just say something's supposed to be a hundred volts. And I looked at it, it was 95, but something wasn't working at all. I mean, if something's working poorly, I might look, I guess it depends on what the problem was. If something wasn't working at all, then 5% wouldn't be troubling to me. I need to look for something more significant. If something wasn't working as tightly as it should be, uh, or as precisely, probably 5% still, I would probably still wouldn't look at that very closely. But if it were down to 90, I would probably say, well, maybe this is doing it. it but usually you don't, you don't come into those splitting hair situations. Um, this little animation here kind of shows what happens when you change the voltage of your power supply and how much current flows and when you change the resistance. So again, you won't be able to see this if you just look at the, if you just view these slides in Google, but if you download them and play them in PowerPoint, then you'll see these things that we're seeing in class. So the direction of current flow. We've been kind of talking about currents leaving the positive and it's going through the load and that energy gets converted into work and then comes back. But wait, electrons have a negative charge. So why are they going away from a positive terminal? They should be coming this way and they are. So why do we say, well, the current's going around this way? Here's why. Long time ago, when people were starting to learn about electricity, they thought that electrons had a positive charge. And so they wrote up, um, wrote up all their books and all their lessons and all their scientific journals 
And that's what it was. They were positive, so they left the positive terminal. They went around, they were attracted to the negative terminal, and that's what it was. Until some years later, and some other people were working on it, and they figured out that, well, wait a minute, electrons have a negative charge. And they're like, Bob, do you realize what this means? We're going to be famous. And they go in and say, look what we found out. And everybody's like, eh, well, we don't want to change it now. We already, we already made all the books and stuff. So they just left it. And it's called conventional theory that positive goes to negative. But in re the real world, the way it really happens, it's, it's this, that the electrons go to positive. The thing is, it doesn't matter in how circuits behave, whether a wire's whether it's going through a wire one direction or the other doesn't make any difference. The only time that you get into this type of an issue is when you're actually working at the electron level with um, with semiconductors, especially, and then you really have to be into it uh, as to what actually makes a transistor work. And we're not even going to get into things at that level in this class. So it doesn't matter which one of these two that you use, but most everything uses conventional flow. All right, so let's, let's solve a problem. 48 volts. It's push, trying to push as much as it can through that 3 ohm resistor, but Given that that's exactly 48, and given that that's exactly three ohms, an exact amount of current will result. How much? 16 amps. 16 amps, yeah. 16 amps. All right. So we use Ohm's law. So looking over here, the way this little wheel works, I don't know what I is, so I'm going to go over here to I and see how to get I. Well, I can get I by taking the square root of power over R, but I have R, but I don't have the power. That's not going to be good. I can take the power, divide it by V, but again, I have V, but I don't have power. Or I can take the voltage and divide it by the resistance. Those two variables I do have. So I will use that one, and I will take 48 divided by 3 ohms, and I'll get 16 amps. That's how Ohm's law work. You should know intuitively that relationship between voltage, resistance, and current. This is how Ohm, George Ohm, decided to put it down in mathematics to get precise numbers. What about the power? Well, the power, I don't know. I have to go over here and look. So power, I can get any of these three ways, because I have all of these variables. I have V times I, so I can take my I times V. I also have R times I squared, so I can take 3 times 16 times 16. I can take V squared divided by R, so I can take 48 times 48 divided by 3, and all of those will give me the exact same answer. If any of you have calculators, on hand, you probably should have come up with that by now. 768 watts. Very good. 768 watts. Everybody clear on that? Questions? All right, good, good. Or if I would have taken, so I don't know which method you use. Which one did you use? Uh, voltage times amperage, or yeah. Okay. Current. Yeah. Voltage Current. times. Yeah, sure. Um, and if I would have done th this way, I would have come up with the same answer, obviously. Uh, they talk a little bit about connections now. And what they're showing here are bad connections. And you have high resistance and losses. You have losses in the form of heat. I might have mentioned before, almost anytime you have losses or inefficiencies, it's almost always evidenced as heat. If you look at an internal combustion engine, I don't, I think it's like 20 to 30 percent efficient. So, you know, every dollar you put in, you're only getting 30, 30 cents worth out of that dollar. The rest of it, not going to motion, it's going into heat. That's why you have to have cooling systems. I mean, you're making fire inside of your engine, so you expect it to get hot. But uh, your light bulb gets hot. 
an incandescent bulb gets hot because it's inefficient. And I don't want to pay for heat energy. I want light energy, but it's not efficient. So loose connections or corroded connections cause inefficiencies. There's going to be a drop in voltage because of this added resistance, and there's going to be heat um, that results as well. And that can be a problem. That heat can be a, a real problem. Uh, this shows a little bit like if you've got stiff wire and you're going to put it on a, it's like on a receptacle probably. You bend a little loop in it like this, and then you, the key is that you, it goes around the same way that you turn it to, to tighten a screw. Otherwise, you'll just spit it out or it won't be tight. Crimp ons, if you've ever used uh, the connectors, like there's spades and then there's rings, you know, eyes and there's forks. Um, you strip off little bit of insulation and you stick the wire in there and then you put it in a crimper and smash it down. And when you get in the, the real labs here in a couple of weeks, any of these things you want to see, these are sometimes these are called wire nuts or scotch locks. Uh, if you've ever, you've probably used these, they package them with ceiling fans and light fixtures and things like that. But if you have any questions about any of these things, you know, bring it up and we'll go search it out while we're there. Screw on connectors. You know, I don't think I've ever used one of these, but I like the way it works. You know, you strip the wires and you put it in this thing and you tighten down the set screw and then you just cut this off. And then I really like this, this thing, fits over it and threads, threads down on that. It's pretty nice. Bad about coming loose. Huh? They're bad about coming loose. What, what part, the wires come out? Yeah. The, sets. the, the mm. set screw will end up pulling through the wires. Ah, good to know. Uh, heat shrink tubing. I don't know if any of you use this or not, but it's like a plastic that when you heat it, it contracts. It reduces its size considerably. So what they have here is they probably soldered a couple wires together and they want to insulate it. So you take a piece of shrink wrap tubing and you slip it over there, heat it up with a heat gun, and it'll shrink down on there and seal it off, seal it off and insulate it. So this side, here, here's the thing. This side of this wire goes to a device and this side of the wire goes to another device or a plug or something. And there's been too many times that I like to admit to where I needed to do this, but I forgot to put the tubing on before I made the solder connection. So, there's a little tip for you. You just wrap an electrical tape like everyone else? Yeah, but I already cut a piece off of my roll. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's showing soldering, iron soldering guns. So if you solder, yeah, if you solder two wires together, make sure you put the shrink tube on first. That's a pretty good connection electrically and in terms of construction, you know, in terms of, of mechanical integrity, it won't come apart very easily because you're essentially welding, um, welding metal. And this shows if you're soldering to a terminal like this, how you bend the wire, apply the heat. Um, the edge detector, you know, we're talking about connections and these just fit into a slot and there's metal in the slot and there's metal on this that connect together. And the same thing inside of these, you've got pins and sockets, it's metal to metal connections to, to, to establish and maintain continuity. And coax, coaxial cable shows how to do that shows how to do fiber optics. Okay, series and parallel circuits. 
Um, circuits can be simple or they can be very complex. So we'll take a look at some simple ones first. Here is a very simple series circuit. Here's my power source. Instead of a battery, I have a whole power plant. Here's my conductors that are flowing into my electrical load. This could be a residence, it could be a city. Whatever it is, this is my electrical load. I'm converting electrical energy into all different kinds of other forms. And then I don't use it up. I don't use up those electrons. They're just flowing through. So that when you say you're using electricity, uh, you're not expending it. You're kind of borrowing it because you're spitting it right back out again. It's that motion, that flow, that's just like tur water turning a water wheel that gets the work done in your devices. So this is like the water company spitting you out the water. You've got all your little water wheels that are lighting lights or whatever they're doing. That water keeps on flowing and they're just charging you for the supply. Um, these are some simple devices that you would see in most circuit protected devices. We said last week, they're not there to protect you. They're there to protect wires. They're essentially fire protection devices because if you try to put too much current through a wire than what it was designed for, the friction that's created is so great that the heat will generate, be generated enough to melt off insulation and that might cause a short circuit that even has more current flowing and it can start fires. So protected devices are primarily a fire prevention device. And then conductors, we've talked a little bit about circuit board traces, uh, cables, wires. There's anything that's, that's carrying the uh, the current to the load is a conductor. Control devices, because I don't always want current flowing to my loads. I don't want the lights on when I'm trying to sleep. Um, I can interrupt the flow of current with these control devices. I control the current of the current flow. Switches, or I manually do it. Thermostats, an example of an automatic um, switch and dimmers, an example of a variable control. So how does a dimmer work? Does it increase the resistance of the electron flow? You can probably look at it that way. It certainly is going to regulate the current flow. It's, it take, uh, and the, the dimmer that you might see in your car for your dash lights may just be a variable resistor. Uh, again, we'll probably talk about this more in, later in the semester. But in any case, any time that your load is changing the work output, it's because the current going to it is being changed. So if you want to look at a dimmer as regulating the current flow, whether it's through resistance, usually it's through semiconductors because that's a lot, uh, it's a lot cooler. Not like, not like cooler, but the temperature is much yeah, lower. Yeah, temperature wise. Yeah. Okay. The dimmer act the same as a, like a volume knob or do they have different, like are they different internally? Well, it, it's the same in that it controls how much current's going to the load. So it's the same that way. Um, the way that it does that is different. I would say the volume control, like on your guitar, Mm -hmm. It's more like the dimmer switch in your dash lights. It's probably a resistor. Yeah. Um, okay, so load devices are anything that takes the electrical energy and converts it into some other form. In this case, we're converting to light or motion, mechanical energy. Some common schematic symbols. You should, it doesn't take too much imagination to see how these came up. 
this is a switch that you're going to just throw into place. This is the push button switch. This is a breadboard. Uh, we'll talk more about breadboards later and you'll be using them in the lab, but the way this works, here's my, my voltage supply, nine volt battery, and I'm hooking up positive to this hole. All these holes along this way are common. When I say they're common, I mean they're all touching one another. Whenever you talk about a circuit common, that means where components come together to a single point. Underneath of this is a strip of metal so that if I put something into this hole, there's continuity between that hole and the next one. Any hole along this line is the same electrical point and the same thing down here. I come in here with the negative, put it into this row. Everything along this row is common. So this point, this hole is the same as this hole electrically as this hole is this hole. So now I plug these resistors, one at the top here at positive and one down here in the negative. And I've taken another one, done the same thing. This is what it looks like in real world. This is what it looks like represented with the schematic. Everything on this side is common. You can visualize and you should visualize as being a single point. I mean, I could have like just drawn this right over top of this and I could have taken this and drawn it right over top of this. Couldn't tell what it is, but if you spread them out, now you can see the individual elements. But this, this is just the same as if I were touching directly right there. And this is the same electrically if I were touching right there. So, so the electricity isn't flowing through here? Through where? I, I wrote it on your screen oh. right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is it flowing through there at all? Or is that just representative that there's a resistor on both sides here? It's absolutely flowing through there. It is. Okay. This voltage is trying to force electrons. If it can find a path, it will. If it's open circuit, it can't. But it gets to this point, and it's like, oh, uh, here's a path. And yeah, there's some resistance, so I can only push so much through here, but I can get some through and back. And also, hey, here's a path. I can shove some down this way, too. So how does that affect the voltage between this point and, like, say, this point? But I didn't see your other point. This oh, the one. point between here and here? Yeah. Well, how does it, doesn't. it How does it, it change? It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't change. It's exactly the same. The reason's exactly the same because you have to look at this point, this point, and this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and this point as being the same point. There's nothing that does there's nothing that makes it not the same point because we're assuming that these conductors have zero resistance and so they're just like putting them all common, the same point. But it does have an effect on the current. I'm just going to wait on that too, because this is another question that I don't want to confuse you with my answer when I know it'll become clear later. Okay. I have one more question about this. Uh, is, sure. Isn't it true that electricity will always take the path of least resistance? No, that's humans. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a good question because if I had, oh, because here we have a hundred and a 50. Let's okay. analyze this a little closer since we're kind of exploring these things. So here's electricity current to be specific. So I want to try to get away from saying electricity is flowing because it's really current is flowing. So current is trying to flow and it gets to this junction and it's like, bang, I can go 50 or 100, what am I going to do here? It's not really making conscious decisions, obviously. But if, it, if what you were saying is true, none would flow this way and it would all go this way because that's the path of least resistance. It doesn't work that way um, because it's not human. It's bound more by physics. Um, so what's going to happen here is this amount of force is trying to push 
it's the same amount of force here as here, as we talked about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this amount of force is trying to push down this way and it can, and it can push some down this way. Which one's going to get more? This path or this path? Well, now I don't know. <laughs> the Think about it. 50 ohms. Why do you say that? Why do you say that? Because it's got less resistance. Okay. That's, that's right. If I've got a certain amount of push, the same amount of push here as I have here, but I've got <laughs> less opposition to my push here, then, yeah, I'll be able to move more as a consequence. So if I if I jumped uh, a no load wire across before the first resistor, would it would that still be true? Would they both still be getting load? No. I'll, I'll say okay. Away. Okay. So here's what I'm gonna here's what I'm gonna say. In theory, it's true. But if you put a no resistance, you're saying a solid wire. If I jumpered this out. I'm going, to, I'm going to divide 9 by 0. Mathematically, it's, it's, you're not allowed to do that, but the number approaches infinity. When you have a number that high, if there's anything flowing here at all, it's so minimal that you can discount it because you might as, you might as well say that it's all going this way because – Almost infinity is going this way, but not quite. But you're not going to be able to measure this. What's going to happen if you did that is this is going to blow up. Right. You don't have a protective device. There's no fuse in here. When you have current that's going up towards infinity, this thing's going to heat up so much. Uh, there's going to be some bad stuff happen. I don't know how it's going to show up, but it would. But going back to this, um, so yeah, I've got nine volts pushing this way and I have nine volts pushing this way. This one's pushing back less. So I'm going to get more moving this way. Can anybody tell me how much more? Not enough, not a number, but just kind of a proportional. Twice as much? Twice as much. Yeah, good. Now they're looking at different ways to represent. We looked at some schematics. This is a wiring diagram. In wiring diagrams, you actually see the wires and where they're, the junction boxes, the devices, and even sometimes like screw numbers and terminal numbers, where things go, where they really physically land. A block diagram just gives you a general thing. Here I've got a, uh, a speed sensor. Uh, this, is, this must be on a car. Not necessarily, but I've got a speed sensor. I would call this a tachometer because it's looking at rotational speed. Then that in gets input into uh, an interface uh, that converts it into a microprocessor. We'll learn a lot more about this stuff too later on. Um, and then it goes back out into the real world. So here's the real world. It gets into the computer here and comes back out in the real world. It's a digital display. This is really just showing different ways to show uh, how things are hooked together electrically. Simple series circuit. Yeah, that's what it looks like in the real world. That's what it looks like on paper. Get used to seeing what it looks like on paper because when you go to control rooms or the back of devices or in the box where the breakers are, wherever the instructions are, the owner's manual, you're going to more likely see the circuit represented like this. You need to go, well, in the real world, I'm going to be looking for something that looks kind of like this. Now, what is the S representative of? Switch. A switch. Okay. A switch. Okay. I've seen it more often as SW, just so that, you, that Yeah. All right, so here's something we need to probably take a look at. I've got 12 volts, and I have an open switch, and if I looked at voltage across each of these lamps, I've got nothing. There's no current flowing through here. I will see the entire voltage across the open switch. Remember, 
Remember that voltage is the difference between two points. And the difference of force, the difference of charge, however you want to look at that, it's a difference between two points. You can't get a voltage by just looking at one point. You always have to get a voltage by comparing that point to another point. So in this case, if I were to compare the terminal, negative terminal, to the positive terminal, I would see 12 volts. And if I compare this side of the bulb to this side of the bulb, I've got nothing on either side, so there's no difference between the sides. So there's zero volts. You know, I'm measuring a difference, right? 12 volts is a difference. So I've got push. I got all this push trying to move something, but I can't. So all this pressure's built up here, maximum 12 volt. On this side, I've got nothing. So the difference between this full force and nothing is 12 volts. If I look at it the other way, assuming the current's flowing this way, maybe it's a little easier to visualize because it, there's no electrons even going through this light. Let's think about this. Think of those electrons as being ping pong balls in a cardboard tube. This conductor and these filaments are all made out of metal, which are filled with atoms and electrons, just like ping pong balls in a cardboard tube. And this is open, so these ping pong balls have no place to go. This is a dead end. If I try to move a ping pong ball, I can't. This is deadheaded. This deadheaded, nothing's flowing here. There's all these electrons waiting to be moved, but they can't go anywhere because the drawbridge is open. So once I close that switch, now the force can move them and they will, like down here. So I've got all that push, but there's no place to go. And then on this side, I've got no push at all. So the difference between maximum push, 12 volts and nothing is 12 volts difference between those two points. Down here, however, I've got current flowing, and across the switch, I've got zero volts. Why? Because a closed switch puts each side of it common, so there's essentially a short circuit or the same point. There's no difference between these two points, and a voltage is the measurement of the difference between points. The difference is nothing. That's like if you're standing, standing on a square, and you wanna measure how far it is from that square to the same square, it's nothing, there's no difference. But from here to here, across these lamps are 12 volts, but notice this, and we'll talk more about this in subsequent lessons. Notice that these, these lamps, because they're equal in resistance, the voltage is equally divided among them with four volts a piece. That's an important characteristic of how series circuits work. That's something you should know. Again, we'll kind of look at it more in depth later, uh, but this is a good, good way to get, to kind of catch wind of it now. In a series circuit, the individual voltages are divided proportionally, not equally. They're only divided equally here because the resistances were equal. Again, we'll get to more on that later. Here are two, two series controls. To make this light come on, what do I need to do? Engage both switches. Both. Yep, close one, doesn't do any good. Um, so they, this can be a logic circuit if you wanted to think of it that way, because um, let me give you a scenario. Logic is supposed to solve problems. And let's say I'm a, um, a design engineer at a place and the, and the production foreman comes to me and he works at Fenton Glass and he says, you know, I got a problem here. I've got a packer at the end of the conveyor. He's packing glass that comes through the, the, off the line. And I have a couple of guys inspecting it. And they sit there, there's a light on the other side of the conveyor. So this glass work comes between 
then in the glass and they can look through the glass and see if there's any bubbles or cracks, any kind of flaw. And if there is, they don't want a Fenton label going off. So his job is to pull it off and smash it so that it can never be packed away as thin. That, got, that actually has to be a stress reducing job just to like grab Fenton glass and smash it. But anyway, just to make sure they have another person on down the line that does the same thing. That way, by the time it gets to the packer at the end of the conveyor, it's, you've got two things in place to make sure that's going to work. So as a production foreman, it's like, I've got a problem. Sometimes these guys are getting up and going out to smoke, and there's just one guy there. Sometimes there's neither guy is there. I need to find a way to keep that from happening. It's like, I can, I can take care of that. So what I do and over here, instead of having this as a light bulb, I say, this is your motor that goes to your conveyor belt. And these little switches, these are going to be under the seats, just like on your riding lawnmower, your seat belt switch under your seats. And by gosh, one of them sits down, won't work. Both of them's got to sit down before that conveyor can run. And it doesn't mean they're paying attention, by the way. But they've got to both be in their seats for that conveyor to run. If either one of them gets up, it's going to stop. So because it's logic and you say, well, you use terms like if this is true and this is true, which means on or off if it's false. If this is true and this is true, then this is true. We'll get more into that when we start talking about logic and control systems too. But because of that, you can represent how this circuit operates with what they call a truth table. And a truth table just shows your inputs. And here I've got A and B, these are my inputs. And my output of this system is my lamp or a conveyor in our example. So if this is, if both of these are off, what's the deal with the lamp? Well, off. Off. And what happens if it's like this? Off. And this. And so both of them have to be on to get that. Okay, good. Yep. All right, here we have loads in parallel. Notice that in parallel, um, this point, this point, and this point are all common, all the same point, all the way along here. Doesn't matter how long this line gets, in theory, it's all the same point. And on this side, because this is a closed circuit, these are all the same point. So this point, this point, this point is the same as this point, same as this point. So there's 12 volts across all of them. In this case, in a series circuit, we saw that the voltage was divided proportionally among the loads. Here we see that they all have the same, they all have the same voltage. But what's different, what's different is the current. Because going back to the example we had, if we have a series circuit, the current that flows through one flows through the other. In this case, the current gets divided. We'll get more into that when we talk about it. Just Heads up, that's what's coming. All right, so controls in parallel. This case, neither one of those people are sitting there. Truth table says, and you should be able to see that, this is not gonna work. In this case, if one person's there, if this input is true, then the output goes true. If they switch it around the other way, this one's false, but this one's true, I still get a true. And if they're both down, true, true, I get a true. Because of this, just go back briefly here. Because of this, this is often, if you talk about logic circuits, this is an and logic. Because input A and input B have to be true before the output's true. Doesn't have, however many of them I have in series, in an AND circuit, all inputs have to be true before the output's true. In this other case, this is an OR circuit. If any of this, this or this or this or this, no matter how many you have, if any of them are true, the output's true. 
All right, so a little bit of measuring. This is this is what you saw, maybe saw before. This is showing the connectors where you plug in your leads. Then it shows different settings, different ranges. This continuity checker makes a beep. You put it on a piece of wire, and if it doesn't have a break in it, it'll beep. It'll also read zero ohms. Okay. All right, measuring voltage. You measure voltage in parallel. You got the, the red lead to the positive. You got the black lead to the negative. It's reading 12.6 volts. Most, I'll say this, most power sources, batteries, and even even uh, out of power supplies will read higher under no load conditions and then when you put something on them load the voltage will drop some to where they're supposed to be it's normal it's expected and um, they calculate all that out I put red to positive, black to negative. What happens if I reverse them? I get a negative number because, again, I'm measuring between two points. From here, I'm saying this side, this is positive with respect to this side. But if I switch it, the opposite is true. This side is negative now compared to the other side. If this were an analog meter, so if you've got a, a digital meter, this is what happens. If you have one of those old analog meters that has a dial, you may break it or bend, bend the armature or something like that. Amp meters, you have to hook in series. If you hook an amp meter, take the probes of an amp meter, and you hook it up like this, you can damage it. So you have to open the circuit up so that the current will leave the source and go in the amp meter on one lead and then out the other side and then go into your load. Again, if you don't do this, you can blow up your amp meter. A clamp on amp meter gets away from that, but there's some limitations. We're gonna learn that whenever uh, electricity runs through a, a conductor, it creates a magnetic field around it. And this device will read that magnetic field and can tell how much current's flowing through there to create that amount of uh, field. So this is a clamp on. The thing about this is, it has to be only across one wire. So if I've got an appliance like on a lamp, like a lamp, this is a lamp cord, there's two wires in there, one going to the lamp and one coming back. And if I put a, an amp meter around that or an air conditioner that's plugged in the wall, it's going to say zero because the magnetic field that's being caused going into the load counters the opposite magnetic field is created as it's coming back the other way. So both of those two things negate one another and it'll say zero. Measuring resistance, turn off the power or you'll blow up your meter or, you know, even at, even at best, you'll get wrong results. And you also have to remove one side from the circuit because if I wanted to measure this resistor and I put one lead here and, and this was still down here, I would be reading everything else in the circuit. I've got to isolate one end so that the meter can read into this and not have a complete loop. So disconnect one end of the resistor, disconnect the power. Single wire automotive circuit. Uh, so, okay, I got my battery for my car and an insulated wire. Here's my light, and we'll just say it's a dome light. And here's my switch. This switch is normally closed, so when I close the door, that opens the switch and the light goes out. And now when I open the door, the switch will close, the light will come on. 
Once that door is in a position where this switch closes, the current leaves, goes through the load, it gets to here and it's marked as going to ground. Sometimes this is also called common, but you notice that this is also at ground. So it's grounded to the frame of the car. And that allows the frame of the car to be a conductor. So the current flows through the load, through the closed switch, into the chassis, along the chassis, back into the battery. So there's my continuity. It doesn't stop here. It's actually common or connected to here. Uh, just type solid wire, stranded wire, cables, multi-conductor cables, lamp cord. It comes in all different kind of sizes. Um, solid wire and stranded wire. Imagine your uh, extension cords if they were stiff wire and you had to roll them up every time and unroll them. They just don't, they're just not made for that and they will break over time. So, so solid wire, a good application for that is where you're going to put wire up and you want it to stay there. Like when you're wiring your house and you bend it and it kind of just stays there on its own. You might have to tap, put a staple here and there. But if I were trying to use solid wire for my sweeper cord, you know, after a while it, it would break from bending it back and forth. Stranded wire is really good and flexible. It's, it's a matter of flexibility. Um, printed circuit boards, you've seen the traces on a board. They're conductors, obviously. American wire, wire gauges, you know, when they first started making wire, you know, it's like get super heavy duty wire, get your giant wire. And it wasn't standardized. So American wire gauge came out that standardizes wire. The thing to note here, as you can see, as your numbers get smaller, the wire gets bigger. So it's a little counterintuitive until you just realize that's how it works. Uh, this is showing some applications, lighting, receptacles, typically 14 gauge, 15 amp circuit breaker. That's typical. That 15 amps going through a 14 is safe and that's what it's designed for. Uh, I've got 12 gauge because it's carrying 20 amps to make that particular device do its job in a reasonable amount of time. Heavier current requires heavier conductors and circuit breakers. Okay, let's talk a little bit about line voltage drop. I said, theoretically, those wires are all the same. But when you get out in the real world, there are some drops. There, there is some resistance in wires. It's usually because of you design what you're going to, you design things for how you're going to use it. It doesn't present a problem. This is what this is showing. I have my voltage source, my AC voltage source. Maybe this is my 240 breaker at the house. And here's my motor. My, if my run of wire is long enough and there's like a certain amount of resistance in here, and it has to go back so the same amount of resistance is in the return path. You know, I'm losing five volts here. I'm losing five volts on the way back. So I only get 230 volts. Well, percentage wise, that's insignificant. So Tom, like what you were talking about, when do we worry? If, you know, if I've got 240, but then I go down here and it says 230, that's okay. You know, you might even expect that. And this thing is just working just fine. You know, if you expected it to say 240 and you got 230 and you might go, well, this messed up. But if that motor's not working, it's not because it has 240 and 230 instead of 240. If the power company charges me 13 cents per kilowatt hour, how much will it cost me to run the circuit below for 24 hours? And apparently this was on a test at some time and could show up again on a test. So might want to take a look at this. Well, I want to know how much it's going to cost me. I need to first know if they're charging me 13 cents per kilowatt hour, how many kilowatt hours do I have? What is a kilowatt hour? A kilowatt hour 
is kilo is kilowatts or a thousand watts times hours. Okay, well I've got my hours. There's 24, so I've got that part of kilowatt hours. 24. Now I have to come up with the kilowatts. So how do I figure up what kilowatts? Well, watts is power. So to get power, I use that little one of those formulas. But I'm going to use probably for me, because I could use voltage times current, but I don't have current right here. So I'm going to use what I have. I've got volts and I've got ohms. And one of those formulas for power was volts squared divided by ohms. So I'm going to take 120 volts times 120 volts, and that is 14,400 and divide that by 12, and that gives me 1,200, 1,200 watts. But there wasn't kilowatts. So to get kilowatts, which are 1,000 watts, I have to take my watts and divide it by 1,000, and then I get 1.2 kilowatts. Everybody good with that process? Now that I have kilowatts and I can multiply it by 24 to get kilowatt hours, each one's 13 cents. I come up with, it's going to cost me $3.74. So that's how you solve a problem like that. And in doing that, somebody says, well, look, you know, I'm thinking about getting this, um, this water heater or this, whatever this device is, a motor, a fan for, a, a, for whatever it is. And you need to kind of give them an idea of what it's going to cost. This is what you do. It's like, how, many, how long is that thing going to be on every day or a month? And with those kind of numbers, you check with the power company, see what their rate is. You can give them the cost of using that device for the need that they have over a period of time.